Welcome to Circuit Talk. My name is Nitin Shah, and in previous Circuit Talks, we've spoken to experts from the semiconductor industry, such as Todd Holmdel from Microsoft. Today, we have Rick Gotcher from LAM Research. So, Rick, welcome, welcome. Um, first, let's start with, uh, please tell us about yourself. Yeah, um, so I'm the Chief Technology Officer at LAM Research, uh, which I have been since uh, 2017. Prior to that, I ran all of the product groups at LAM Research uh, from 2009 through 2017. Um, before that, I had various jobs, uh, ran the Etch division at LAM Research for a number of years, joined LAM Research in 1996 after having spent the first 15 years of my uh, career at Bell Laboratories. I'm a, a PhD in physical chemistry and uh, my area of specialty was, uh, and in some sense still is molecular spectroscopy. But uh, uh, so I'm a scientist, but I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that the National Academy of Engineering has accepted me amongst their ranks, although I'm not really an engineer. That's great. Thank you Rick, for that background. And um, yeah, it, it's funny, you and I share a common heritage of being at Bell Laboratories in those very early days. So I um, wanted to ask you firstly, a little bit about um, the context of the CHIPS Act and specifically, and we'll dig into more detail later on, about a concept that I think you've been advocating called Semiverse. So just right. a few talk notes about that. And then I also want to learn more about LAM research itself. So Semiverse, what is that concept? And then LAM research, what does it do? Okay, well, maybe I'll start with LAM research first. Okay, sure, please. So LAM is one of the world's largest uh, providers of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Uh, we provide equipment to everybody making chips all over the world. And I think it's fair to say that um, any electronic device, this is the prototypical uh, device that, that people carry around in their pockets, um, and every chip in those devices, whether it's a, a phone or a computer, anything electronic uh, that has chips in it, every one of those chips, I can guarantee you, has gone through a LAM machine at least once. So uh, we're the ones, uh, along with our peers and our competitors, who enable all the, the, the silicon technology to exist. Um, we have more than 16,000 employees. We're, we're growing extraordinarily rapidly. We've, we've added uh, thousands of employees just over the last couple of years during this pandemic um, to try and uh, help our customers satisfy unprecedented demand for integrated circuits. Uh, we're deployed all over the world. Our, uh, we have manufacturing facilities uh, in California, in Oregon, in Ohio, in Europe, and in Asia. 67% uh, of our manufacturing is done in the United States today. Uh, we have R&D going on everywhere. Every place our customers have a manufacturing site or a development center of their own, yeah. LAM is there also doing R&D collaboratively with them. Um, but uh, the focal point of our R&D, our most advanced R&D, uh, is in the United States, uh, primarily on, on the West Coast. So that's LAM. Um, now, yep. the, the, the concept of the, the semiverse, um, to be honest, we're still figuring out what, okay. what we mean by that. So if I, say, if I may, I, you know, a lot of us hear about the metaverse and the applications and so on. So when you introduce the concept of semiverse, I'm really curious about how you see it, how it and, and its sort of evolution over time. So please tell us more. Yeah, uh, uh, happy to do so. As I said, we're, there are a lot of details and a lot of concepts that I think still need to be fleshed out. Yeah. But we've, we, we, I think some things are very, very obvious. So we envision, first of all, the semiverse absolutely is a play off the, the metaverse yeah, metaverse term. And it really corresponds to a virtual representation of the semiconductor ecosystem. Okay. But one should not fall into the trap of thinking it's only about the virtual representation. The virtual representation and the physical reality that it mirrors, think digital twins everything, have to coexist, will continue to coexist indefinitely into the future. You, you can't have a digital representation of something without anchoring it with real data and the real world. So there's a very intimate interplay that must take place, particularly in the semiconductor arena. 
advances in semiconductor research, whether it's advances in techno uh, device technology, system architecture, chip architecture, materials, require innovative breakthroughs, differences in thinking that you're not going to get from a calibrated model of what exists today. Got it. Right. So there's this interplay. As we learn more, as we do things in the physical world, data will flow seamlessly into the virtual world, make the virtual models more and more capable. And someday, I, I would never say never, maybe machines will be capable of innovating in ways that humans do. But that's not the, the near term or probably even the midterm vision. Mm -hmm. So um, we when it comes to the semiconductor ecosystem, what we're imagining is that uh, you've got a virtual representation, which is much easier for people to access, which is right. anchored in the real world. And uh, the idea is that you can open this up to a vast number of innovators who can contribute novel ideas and run their experiments in the virtual space to the extent that it's calibrated against the real space, evaluate new ideas, new approaches, and, and for a fraction of the cost in a fraction of the time. Um, that's that's one way of envisioning what the semiverse will yeah. be like. So, Rick, if I may, uh, just to maybe recap what you said. I mean, your your, your industry, your technologies are deeply grounded in in the elements of physics and chemistry and. And, and right. almost atomic level engineering. Level engineering. Absolutely. Absolutely. On the other hand, I think what you're saying is that by using these tools, which probably includes data automation, maybe artificial intelligence and so on, it becomes much more accessible for designers and innovators to be able to do what I interpret what you said is like what if experiments, to be able to do things in the virtual world initially and make it much more efficient and faster to actually do things in the physical world as well. Is that the right? Concept. You got it. You got it exactly. Um, so the, you know, as I said, um, this semiverse will have to learn and grow and become more capable in time. Right. So initially, there'll be much more physical experimentation, as mm -hmm. there is almost exclusively today, not entirely. Um, and even there, we want to we envision a semiverse that's set up such that people can access the physical access assets without necessarily being physically present. So um, we see a network of interconnected laboratories where, because if you think about innovation in semiconductors, we've talked about this a lot, um, you have to innovate, inno innovate up and down the technology stack. So no one physical uh, entity is likely to contain all the capabilities that will allow you to innovate in a big way. So they have to be interconnected. Uh, you want to provide broad access, otherwise you restrict the number of innovators and you're going to restrict the pace of innovation. Right. Yeah. So uh, there, there, there is a, uh, a remote access, um, broad access uh, concept associated with the semiverse. Now, as you generate data and imagine the laboratories that we have today being mm -hmm. augmented with more and more capabilities, right. particularly right. sensorization, interconnection, uh, data management so that the data are flowing seamlessly from maybe one facility to another. Um, they're, 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 the data are stored with the right context such that a large number of people can go in, access data, mine the data, and build a more and more capable semiverse over time, such that so the semiverse means... becomes increasingly the vehicle by which people start mm -hmm. to test their innovative ideas. So this means sort of uh, being able to do a well thought through remote robotic experimentation without your physically having to go there and Absolutely. yet gain access to the data because you can control parameters, temperatures, different aspects of the process technologies that are fundamental to your right. business. Right. And to be able to do that with, with a multitude of innovators across the nation. Right. Exactly. But again, if we limited ourselves to that physical world, that would be a huge advance forward over where we are today. In my opinion, we're, we're under leveraging the existing capabilities that are out there. Yep. But by using those data and continuously updating the, the digital twin representations of the real world, 
we can start to accelerate the pace of innovation. And that's what's so critical. In, in my mind, the semiverse is all about not just innovating, but yes. increasing the pace of innovation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, for many of us trying to get, uh, I'm changing subjects a little bit, which is the immensity of the complex problems you solve is, is quite baffling. You know, people talk about millions and then billions of transistors on a chip. And yet you're operating your uh, technologies to create structures which literally are at the dimensional level of you know, atoms and, and nanoscale things and so on. And I was just wondering if you could give, a, give us some illustrations of that, because it really is for the layperson almost impossible to imagine that you've got trillions or billions of these things that are created in, in multiple dimensions, X, Y, and Z, by, by the tools that you build. So perspectives on that, because it's just quite well, baffling. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is the essence of why you need a semiverse, because the complexity yeah. of making an integrated circuit is extraordinary and getting more complex all the time. Okay. It's causing delays in our ability to innovate. It's causing increases in research and development costs. It's causing increases in manufacturing costs that are quite profound. And so we have to find a better way to develop solutions to these quite complex integration problems. There's hundreds to thousands of steps that go into making an integrated circuit. And to your point, Nitin, the, the, the precision that's required is on the atomic scale. We're measuring things in units of atoms in order to create these most advanced devices. But controlling things on an atomic scale is a little misleading. We can do that with new techniques such as atomic layer deposition, where you put down mm -hmm. one layer of atoms at a time. It's like painting a surface, even with topography. And we've learned how to etch one atomic layer at a time. So we can manipulate things on the atomic scale, but you have to have that atomic scale precision over an entire pizza sized wafer, 300 millimeters. And every wafer has to look like every other wafer coming out of the same machine, but also out of the, the chamber next door or the machine next door or the fab halfway around the world. All of those devices need to be atomically precise. And you have a thousand steps where you have to have this kind of precision. So it's an extraordinarily challenging problem, which today is still being uh, solved, if you will, mostly by empirical trial and error. This is where the semiverse comes in. Right. Uh, you can reduce the cost of the experiments by orders of magnitude. You can decrease the time to get a result by orders of magnitude. And, and that's why we think and it, 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 it's, it's inconceivable to me that we have ever optimized the manufacturing of any integrated circuit with that level of complexity and the approach that we've taken to date. We, the, the, process, right. the solution space is vast. On, on just one unit process in Etch, for example, mm -hmm. we calculated some years ago that there's more than 100 trillion permutations of recipes we can run on that Etcher that will make a measurable difference on the wafer, 100 okay. trillion. I've been told recently by some of my colleagues, I'm off by nine orders of magnitude. It's more like Avogadro's number oh, okay. of patients today. So there's no way that we can uh, empirically explore that space and determine an optimized number. The yeah. only solution is through the semiverse, is through a virtual representation where we can run massively parallel experiments and put these yeah. thousand different steps together in different ways and really hone in on the, the, the best solutions, the most yeah. innovative solutions, the most economic solutions. So let me, um, if I may, I, I just wanted to trigger a little bit on data and the value of data. I can sort of see a semiverse helping, say, a particular technology for a particular machine. But as you said, your company delivers uh, equipment all over the world to most of the large and even smaller manufacturers. And therefore, um, how do you think of the amount of data there is, the amount of data collection you can do, and whether you can aggregate that? Because my assumption is that if you're able to not only do the innovation, but then the production, get data and feedback, 
you could then learn a lot more about how your technology is actually working in the field and improve your processes as well. Does yeah, that that, that's absolutely true. And I think uh, when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing, it's actually mm -hmm. a data rich environment. Every time okay. you're running a wafer, there's lots of data coming off of every machine. The I wafers see. go through metrology. Again, they're me measurements of, of precise measurements of device characteristics okay. or structural characteristics across the wafer. Yeah. Uh, our customers, the semiconductor manufacturers, I think are, are well advanced and moving very quickly in acquiring the data, uh, 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 conditioning the data, um, and then mining it, using it to improve their yields, to improve their productivity. Um, and they're in a, they're in a great place because they, they're in a big data world. Right. What we see though, on the R and D side, which is, uh, and particularly research, the fuzzy front end right. of new product development, whether it's mm -hmm. a new chip or a new, uh, prop piece of processing equipment, you, we actually live in a little data world, a small data world, right, right. in many instances, there aren't lots of data. The, the, you, you, you run some experiments, you get a little bit of data, and then you move on, you try something else. How do right. you link all that together? Yes. And the, we're limited in many cases, particularly with where we have three-dimensional geometries and mm -hmm. complex topographies. How do you even measure, what is your definition of truth? You have to measure something right. by destroying the sample uh, preparing right. it for transmission electron microscopy, right. very expensive operation. It, it might take a day and thousands of dollars for one data point or a few data points. Right. So how can we tackle that problem? Again, uh, we go to the, the semiverse concept. If you take um, a virtual representation of your process, mm -hmm. and we, we've done this, Yes. Um, and now we can run experiments in the virtual space and think about using the, the physics-based model that has some degree of calibration with a little bit of data that you can now use to calibrate, say, a, a deep neural network, mostly right. using virtual data in a, in a fraction of the time, fraction of the cost. And then you can cycle back, inject a little bit more real data and make that model better. So it's a way of, of leveraging a little bit of information and getting a lot more value out of it. Um, so that that's a, a, a big challenge. I think we're making progress on that. Uh, LAM research in particular is invested in that area, but I think the industry as whole is, we're not the only ones out there trying it. So the, the data uh, situation is very different depending on which part of the ecosystem you're looking at. Right, this is a very inspirational discussion today. And again, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.